Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth annual Horseshoe Crab Festival. We hope that we're going to bring some information and fun to an otherwise overcast day. This event is a celebration of an amazing old timer, the Horseshoe Crab. I'm Karen Benfield, and on behalf of the board and staff of New York City Audubon and today's partner organizations, I'd like to thank you for joining us today in our new virtual format. I'll be your host today as we explore the importance of this creature and the reason that we celebrate it each year during the spring high tides. We have an exciting hour and a half for you, and if you've missed visiting the beach, we're going to take you there very shortly for our live horseshoe crab meet and greet. We also have a New York City Audubon staffer who is monitoring the Q&A, so if at any point you have a question or a comment, just please be sure to leave it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to those at the end of the program later on. So let's begin. First up, I'd like to introduce Aurora Crooks. Aurora is volunteer coordinator of conservation programs at New York City Audubon and she's going to give us an introduction to the horseshoe crab and why it is vital to marine ecology. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Aurora Crooks. I am here with New York City Audubon as a part of the conservation team. And today I'm going to be giving you guys a really quick introduction on horseshoe crab biology. So as I said before, I'm with New York City Audubon, and here I am. And here I am to give you guys a really quick introduction to horseshoe crabs and why we care about them so much. So today we're focusing on the Limulus polyphemus, and while that may sound like a Wizarding World spell, that is actually the scientific name for the Atlantic horseshoe crab. Um, the, so the Atlantic horseshoe crab, there's actually four species of crab, but most three other, the three other species are located in Asia. So today we are going to be focusing on the Atlantic horseshoe crab, which is the main one you find across the coast. So today, as I said before, it's going to be horseshoe crab biology and then questions, but I myself actually won't be answering those questions. Caitlin Parkins, our scientist and resident, our resident scientist, will be answering those questions and she'll be answering them at a later time. So, horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs, though, they, though we call them horseshoe crabs, horseshoe crabs are in fact not actually crabs, which is why you never see them at a typical restaurant. Horseshoe crabs are actually more closely related to spiders, ticks, and scorpions than they are to true crabs that you might see on a beach or on a restaurant. Like any other arthropod, they have a hard shell, they have an exoskeleton, and they have a segmented body and jointed legs. Um, and horseshoe crabs are actually kind of a unique class of their own. They have the name mesostromata, which means legs attached to the mouth. And here you see a map of the places you can really find the Atlantic horseshoe crab all along our coasts, our east coast. So the ancient origins of the horseshoe crab. Um, so the horseshoe crab is kind of mysterious in this way that we have forms ident almost identical to the species that were present during the Triassic period, which is 230 MYA or a million years ago. And we have similar species that were also present in the Devonian period, which was 400 million years ago. But the horseshoe crab is kind of unique that the fossil record is exceedingly and extremely rare. And for the Atlantic horseshoe crab, we actually don't have any fossil records at all, which kind of perplexes scientists. So there are mysterious, cre they're mysterious creatures indeed. And before I go forward, I have a quick question for all of you guys. And my question is, how long do you think the average horseshoe crab lives for? Five, 10, 15, 100, 150 years even? I'll give you guys a second. Okay, so I'm seeing five, 10, 15, two, three, um, 40, 35, 30. Um, if you guessed anywhere from, five, if you guessed around 20 or over, then you are actually completely correct because horseshoe crabs can live for over 20 years. They live a pretty long time. I think the highest that's been on record is around 60 or 70 years. So these creatures can be around for a pretty long time. Um, so at around 10 years of age, horseshoe crabs are reaching adulthood. So they have a pretty slow rate to maturity. Like humans, they, they reach adulthood at a very slow rate. So it takes about 10 years for them to fully be fledged adults. 
Um, and so once they are actually adults and once they're ready for adulthood, and I'll get a little bit into their, some of their youth behavior, their youth patterns a little later on, but when they're ready to start breeding at adulthood, that's when you start to see them. That's when they start migrating to the coastal beaches in the spring and in the summer. Um, a horseshoe crab, you know, lives for more than 20 years and there are some threats to the horseshoe crab. So while they can live a long time, they do experience some threats to their, to their existence such as overharvesting, habitat loss, or climate change, but all things in not interrupting them. They live for a pretty long time. But when we're talking about the youth of a horseshoe crab, they grow through the process of molting. So that's how horseshoe crabs grow and that's how they develop. As a horseshoe crab matures and increases in size, it sheds its old exoskeleton, which is the outer shell that you guys see. Um, and it forms a newer, thicker, bigger one and it leaves its old shell behind um, think of it as a similar concept of your baby teeth falling out. And that's one of the main ways they measure their growth and their maturity. Um, so horseshoe crabs need to shed at least once a year as they grow to adulthood. Um, and so as another aside, if you guys see shells of a horseshoe crab on the beach, do not fret and do not panic. More than likely, nothing ate it. More than likely, nothing hurt it. More likely than not, it was a young horseshoe crab who grew out of its shell and decided to move forward. Um, and that is why when you see older horse, you might see horseshoe crabs on the beach um, that have little shells attached to them. And usually that's a sign of their age. They stopped molting. So more than likely shells or other things attached to it. And that's just a sign of their age. So most people, oh, <laughs> well, I see a question about what do horseshoe crabs eat? So I'll let you guys have a few guesses and it'll be really quick, just like 10 seconds of guesses. Horseshoe crabs, what do you guys think they eat? Seaweed. Come on, two more. Filter feeder, little fish, fish, oysters, bottom feeders, shrimp, dead fish, and plankton. Okay, these are all actually really, really amazing responses. And I'm gonna say that horseshoe crabs, they are not picky eaters. They eat almost anything they will feed on. So you are all pretty much correct. They feed on small clams, crustaceans, worms, but they'll also eat other animals and algae and seaweed. And that's, so they're, they're basically omnivores, essentially. And because they have no mandibles, which are our jaws, and they have no teeth, the way they eat the food is that they crush the food up between their legs before passing it over to their mouth to consume it. And they feed primarily at night Usually more the typical meal of a, of a horseshoe crab are mollusks, crustaceans, and worms. And here I have a quick video from an aquarium about a horseshoe crab feeding, and you can see the way that it actually eats the food. And I can't tell exactly what the poor shoe crab is dining on in that particular video, but it looks like a small piece of scallop. And so when we're going into the basic anatomy of a horseshoe crab, you're going to see that a quick glance of the horseshoe crab actually shows the two compound lateral eyes, their hinge, and um, the channel. And so when you're looking at the hinge, that's kind of the way that they facilitate basic movement. So that's kind of the way that they move around and kind of orient themselves. But an interesting thing about the horseshoe crab is that they have a lot of eyes. Um, they have two compound lateral eyes and they're actually not, uh, pretty rare to have that kind of eye. And they have a few light sensing organs and their simple, their compound eyes are actually primarily used for finding mates. So that's actually how they scope out who's who and who they decide to breed with. But the eyes aren't particularly sharp. They have a lot of eyes, but those eyes aren't sharp like a human's or a particular mammal. They're actually more light sensing and um, photosensitive. And they have two, five additional eyes at the top of its shell. They have the two median eyes, the simple eyes, the endolateral pri near the top, and then they have two rudimentary eyes, as I just said before, is kind of used for finding a mate. Um, they're sensible to visible light and ultraviolet range, and their part of their brain kind of sends out signals that control all of these things. So they're actually really complex creatures. 
Um, they seem kind of simple, but they're actually incredibly complex creatures, which is why we're sort of fascinated with them and how they orient themselves around the world. Um, and the Telson, which I'm going to kind of get into later, or pretty soon actually, has a series of light sensors on the top and the side that kind of help them orient between light and dark. So when we're going into the Telson, um, this is, if you've ever flipped over a horseshoe crab or seen a horseshoe crab on its back, this is typically what you're going to see. And I think the thing that attracts the most attention about the horseshoe crab is probably its telson or its tail. And I'm here to say that the telson cannot hurt you. I know I earlier compared them to scorpions, but they are not poisonous. They will not attempt to be aggressive with you. The telson is, like I said before, actually light sensitive and it helps them tell the difference between light and dark. And more often than not, it just actually helps them flip them over, flip themselves over when they're on their back. And in that same light, I want to say, while the Telson cannot hurt you, if you see somebody playing with the Telson or trying to pull on the tail, um, please tell them to, to not do that because they actually really, really need that Telson. It's a pretty essential body part and they could perhaps die if they don't have their Telson to help them orient themselves around the world. Um, that said, the tips of their legs actually have chemos, chemosensory re receptors, so they're actually highly sensitive creatures. And most common is the, um, the small circular things that help them on their legs. This is found on the entire surface of the horseshoe crab, and it's especially concentrated along the edges, ridges, and the spines of their body. Um, they are, like I said before, they are highly sensitive creatures. They have about 60,000 sens sensation sens sensors, essentially. and um, these are what help the horseshoe crab feel. So it's like 60,000 little sensors that are helping them feel and orient themselves around the world, what they're eating, what they're viewing, where, where they actually are. Um, and like I said before, the horseshoe crab looks very tough, but it's a highly, highly sensitive creature. And the horseshoe crab actually has about 7 million axons total per horseshoe crab that allows them to feel and sense the world around themselves. So moving forward, Horseshoe crabs are a dimorphic species, and when I say dimorphic, they are, that means that there's differences between the males and the females for the purpose of producing viable eggs. Um, the males attach themselves to females during, in order to begin the mating process, and you can see that the male has the little clasper or the boxing glove, and for the females, all legs actually look the same. So when you're actually looking at the male, um, basically keep an eye out for that little boxing glove. And more often than not for the female, the female's legs are always going to be the same. And more often than not, the female is actually slightly larger than the male. And the male tends to be slightly smaller and a little bit lighter, but not too much. So those are like basic first glance ways to tell a male from a female horseshoe crab. And there is a male and a female together. Um, so in order for the breeding process to begin, the males attach themselves to the females in order to begin the mating process. And the way that happens is during, um, when they arrive in the thousands or the hundreds of thousands at various nights during the new and full moon, um, they lay anywhere from 40,000 to 90,000 eggs, sometimes even up to 120,000 eggs. Um, so that's a lot per horseshoe crab. So they have a lot of babies. But those eggs are in a high number for a reason because they're often used as a food source or they often don't hatch. So a lot of things can happen. So they make sure to have as many eggs, eggs as possible. Um, and during the breeding season, the way this happens is why, and why we see them during May and June is because horseshoe crabs migrate to shallow waters in order to facilitate their breeding process. A male selects a female and they cling to her back. And then the female digs a hole in the sand and lays her eggs while the male fertilizes those eggs. And like I said, the low range of eggs is around 40,000 and the highest range is about 120,000. So imagine if you, <laughs> the average person, imagine if they had 60,000 kids. I don't think a lot of people would be too happy with that, but the horseshoe crab has 60,000 to 120,000 eggs in batches and a few thousand in general actually hatch. And so here is a group of horseshoe crabs hanging out on the beach, enjoying a lovely day. Um, so this is kind of what you will see and what you'll, what you'll see pretty soon with our live segment. But this is what you would see if you saw a, few, a bunch of horseshoe crabs on the beach. And then later that night, they would be preparing for mating. 
And in terms of eggs, this is what a horseshoe crab egg, these are what the eggs actually look like. You can see that they are actually this lovely, beautiful jade color. Um, and like I said, the average female horseshoe crab lays around 70,000 eggs. So she'll have a lot of these. So if you are on the beach and you see these at any point, more likely than not, those are actually horseshoe crab eggs, which will produce a tiny little baby horseshoe crab if nothing happens to it. And the little baby horseshoe crabs look like this. So you can see that's what happens, that like they get a lot bigger than that, but that is how they start out when they're first figuring their way out in the world, and those are the little juvenile baby horseshoe crabs. So declining populations. The, <laughs> the main reason that we are seeing, so we're seeing decline in population, unfortunately. These creatures have been around for a very long time, as I said before, millions of years, millions upon millions of years, and we're seeing a nine, an 80%, sometimes a 90% decline in some locations. Like I said, for various reasons, such as over-harvesting or coastal de degradation, things along that matter. And that's actually a pretty big deal because not only is the horseshoe crab a pretty cool creature, but a lot of other creatures rely on the horseshoe crab, mainly for sources of, for their eggs as a source of nutrients, like the threatened red knot. And so if the horseshoe crab becomes extinct or this decline continues, it's actually extremely concerning because not only will we lose the horseshoe crabs, but we will also see a significant decline in already threatened species like various species of shorebirds who rely so heavily on the, the horseshoe crab eggs as a source of food. Um, and so while we're seeing, a bear, we're seeing a bear increase or a decrease in horseshoe crabs in various locations, egg density and the amount of eggs is not increasing at all, which is incredibly concerning. So that being said, this is why we focus on the horseshoe crab, and this is why we celebrate the horseshoe crab, because they are incredibly cool creatures and we want to keep them around. Um, that said, this is actually the end of my segment, and thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you guys learned some more about the wonderful, mystical, magical horseshoe crab, but I hope they're a little bit less mystical now. Um, if you guys have any more questions, there will be an Ask a Scientist portrait or um, uh, an Ask a Scientist Q&A with our resident senior conservation biologist, Caitlin Parkins, and she'll be able to kind of answer some of the questions about over-harvesting and why horseshoe crabs are used for a variety of other reasons other than their existence. So with that being said, thank you so much. Happy Horseshoe Crab Festival, and please stay tuned for our next section. Uh. Thank you so much, Aurora, for a really wonderfully comprehensive overview of Limulus polyphemus. Uh, we're now going to take you to the beach where our partners from the American Littoral Society and Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy are live with horseshoe crabs. So Alex Zablocki and Don Reapy, please take it away. Hi everyone, it's Alex from the Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. We're live from Jamaica Bay and American Ball Fields in Broad Channel. Um, I just want to thank all our partners for putting this together today and the over 200 participants joining us. Without further ado, um, I want to introduce Don Reapy from the American Literal Society and our Jamaica Bay Guardian. Hello, everybody. Happy Horseshoe Crab Festival Day. This, this sign was designed by none other than Manus Fenson from Brooklyn. Thank you, Manis. <clears throat> and look, we got more. Just to remember, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a mask. Respect your nurses and doctors. Wear a mask. That's a common yellow throat. He's got his mask on. See that? Lastly, as we walk around, we're finding lots of discarded gloves and tissues and things uh, related to the virus. Please don't throw these things away. Keep them in the environment. Thank you. On my left here is Ranger Rick Chankin from the National Park Service. Good morning, everyone. Rick is here maintaining crowd control. <laughs> so today, our special guest is none other than the horseshoe crab, the Atlantic race, Limulus polyphemus. And with me right here is a little cluster. So here we have a nice little male. And there's one, two, three males associated with a big female. Now we can tell the male from the female. First of all, 
when you pick up a horseshoe crab, you pick them up like that. You never buy the tail, okay? You can rip the tail off. And these guys are totally harmless, right? I could put my hands just right in there and nothing happens. Ow! Only kidding. So the males, the first two claws of a male are little hooks, sometimes related to boxing gloves. And that little hook enables it to attach onto the bigger female who is dug down here laying eggs in the, in the scene. Also with this guy, you know, his little, he's got many, he's got five pairs of legs here, two little uh, feeder arms here, which when he digs around for worms and mollusks, he'll take and put it in his stomach right there. He uses the legs to crawl around, and he uses these swimmerettes here to push off on the bottom. And the tail, which when I was a kid, I thought it was a poison stinger, but it's actually a telson. It's more of a rudder for them helping them get around. And also, if they get turned over, it helps them to, to write themselves up again. So we're not going to disturb that big female. She's under there. There's a male attached. And these would be satellite males hanging around. And when she deposits the eggs, they'll be releasing the sperm. And the more satellite males we have, the, the better it is uh, for fertilization. What she's doing is she's laying hundreds of thousands of these little bluish green eggs here. So the horseshoe crab will lay billions of eggs around Jamaica Bay this time of year. And by the way, it's May 23rd. It's a new moon and it's a high tide. The tides around the new and the full moons are higher, but that's when these crabs come up in greatest numbers. Okay? So, Don, someone was out. asking about the blood in the horseshoe crabs. Could you talk a little yes. bit about the blood? The blood of a horseshoe crab is copper based. If they get a crack in the shell, you'll see a little bluish liquid. So it's bluish fluid because it's copper based, not iron based like ours, which is red. And that blood has a clotting factor when exposed to minor traces of pathogens, um, bacteria. It'll clot, and it'll keep it keeps the bacteria from getting into the crab itself. Now scientists have figured that out, and they we find that in the lab, and they use that lysate, that uh, bluish blood. So if we're getting a vaccination or we're getting uh, a, a any kind of infusion, um, it'll be tested with the blood of the horseshoe crab for its purity. If it clots, it's not good. So they have great medical value. But they also have great ecological value, right? So this time of year, hundreds of thousands of shorebirds are coming through the Northeast. And I'm going to move away a little bit. So here's my, my little female followed by a male. And look, she's got, she's got a colony on her little uh, colony of animals called bryozoans. So each horseshoe crab is actually a, uh, a composite of many, many forms of marine life. Sometimes you find the little flipper shells on them. Here's one of the flipper shells. The particular shell. Come here, you. This guy is an old crab. He, at this stage, they don't shed their, their shells, so these guys will stay here. And there'll be barnacles on some others. Here's another one. Hold it, you. Come over here. Look at all the barnacles on that one. And John, what kind of birds do we have here in the water of Jamaica Bay? And right here, it's a little block of laughing gulls. And the laughing gulls are here also to feed on the horse crab eggs. They'll come ashore and they'll dig around in the, in the sand here to unearth the eggs. How many males can fertilize one female? I've seen uh, one big female with as many as seven males around. So if they're all depositing sperm when she lays the eggs, that ensures that they're, you know, they'll be fertilized. But uh, there's a big flock of shorebirds down there. As you can see, the semi-palmated sandpipers. One, 
One shorebird in particular, the red knot, really heavily relies on the horseshoe crab. The red knot travels straight across from Brazil to the shores of the Northeast. <coughs> and they, the red knots will feed voraciously on the horseshoe crab eggs to build up enough body fat, i.e. fuel, to make it to their northern tons of breeding grounds. So if there's not enough horseshoe crabs around, that will impact the population of red knots. John, when was the last time we saw red knots here in Jamaica Bay? The last time we saw red knots here in Jamaica Bay was two days ago. That's I was incredible. out in my boat and I had a nice flock of about 250. But that's way down from the 2000 or so we'd see 20, 30 years ago. So the red knot is a federally threatened species. <laughs> And, and Don, Richie is just saying that he's been on a number of your walks, especially out in Montauk. So you bring, oh. throughout the year, you bring people to our parks and the wildlife refuge, right? And other places. I do. I normally do uh, one walk a month at the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. But now we have to be virtual, at least for a while. Right. So the next uh, big uh, emergence of the horseshoe crab may be in two weeks during the full moon in early June. So I'm expecting to have another big cluster come up. So yesterday we counted 300 crabs along this shoreline. It seems like uh, it might be a few, uh, not quite as many today. Oops, who did that? And Don, we saw one yesterday with a tag on it. So what does this tag tell us? Well, the tag tells us something about population dynamics, where these crabs go, whether or not this is a discrete population, or whether or not it mixes with a population at Sandy Hook. So things like that. And if you find a tagged crab and you report the number to the Fish and Wildlife Service, they will give you a little horseshoe crab pin like that, a little pewter pin, which I love to wear on my lapel. And Don, do someone's asking if egrets eat the horseshoe crab eggs as well? Uh, I have seen egrets down here. I don't believe they eat the horseshoe crab eggs. What the egrets are doing are eating the small fish that are eating the horseshoe crab eggs. So some days it'll be a whole big banquet here. You'll have hundreds of shorebirds or egrets. I've even seen Canada geese bring their young little goslings down to forage here, along with a nice uh, group of laughing girls. <clears throat> and someone's asking if horseshoe crabs are smart and why might they flip themselves over on the beach? Maybe someone saw one on the beach. What should they, what should they do yes. about that? If you see them flipped over, flip them back. So if you're walking down the beach and you see a bunch of crabs up there on their back, just flip them right, right side up. And they've been here for how many millions of years? These must, they must be pretty smart if they, if they, they are lasted many species, yeah, they're right? Here, they're even older than me. They, they <laughs> date back in the fossil records three to 400 million years, give or take a few million. But uh, this is an ancient living fossil that actually predates the dinosaurs, even the flowering plants. So it's a, an amazing resource to have here in the Bay. So Tyler is asking if we can show someone what a tag crab looks like. So yesterday when we were out here, we saw yeah, one, right? And we right. were looking for him earlier. Yeah, you'll see a big white uh, tag, circular tag with some numbers on it. We could not find one this morning, yeah. Tyler. We're sorry about that. Don, are there any other birds in Jamaica Bay that do feed on the eggs that are dependent upon them? Mostly just the shorebirds. And the shorebirds that we see mostly, what I've seen in recent days, are ruddy turnstone, semi-palmated sandpiper, willet, um, red knot, and, the, and black bellied plover. So, and do the horseshoe crabs eat their own eggs? Do they feed on them? No, the horseshoe crabs actually feed on uh, marine worms and mollusks. You know, little mussels and clams in the muds, as well as marine worms. And they'll dig around and they'll take it and they'll grind it up in, in there. That's great. And Caitlin is going to have a presentation in a few moments that will show one of those tags for yeah. everyone in the line. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's a beautiful Donna. day here in downtown Broad Channel. And you're here on this this, this uh, rubble strewn beach here. Which is That's a nice little male over there. You can see the size difference. Male, male, male. And Dom, um, while you're doing that, someone did ask if, um, as we wrap up, does tagging hurt the horseshoe crabs? So a lot of research goes around the horseshoe crabs and they're well, tagged. Research has shown that it really hasn't hurt them. But it does, uh, they punch it, put a little hole in the shell. 
and stick the uh, the tag on it. Great. But I'm told I, I had that concern myself. People said it, it really so it doesn't hurt them. What hurts them is loss of habitat, loss of shoreline, shoreline bulkheading development, <laughs> and unfortunately they uh, are used as bait for conch and eels. So for a while the eel and conch uh, bait industry would collect thousands of them. Okay, well, Don, I think we're going to wrap up and send it back. Don okay. Reapy from? From the American Literal Society. And I'm Alex from the Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. And our friend here, Rick, from the National Park Service, thanks everyone for joining us. And we're going to take some more look at uh, horseshoe right. crabs here and on the thanks, shoreline. Thanks, Rick, for maintaining fad control here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don? Don, it's Karen. Before you guys go, we had one question um, that is really interesting. Can you explain why the moons are important to when the horseshoe crabs come ashore and lay? Why the moon? Full moon. Because that's when we have the highest tide. And coming up high on the sand ensures that for the next couple of weeks, they'll have a chance to dry out, though they won't be washed out with the continuous uh, tides. Then two weeks later, when you get the next really high tides, the water percolates down in the sand, and the action of the sand and water opens the little crabs and they come out. And there'll be billions and billions as part of the zoo plan of the bay here. Fantastic, thank you. Well, thank you, Don and Alex, for joining us and sharing a little bit of the beach. I think we're all jealous that we aren't also walking on nice, dank sand and sticking our toes in the water. Lucky you. And we have lots of gnats and it's starting to rain. So maybe. <laughs> yeah, <it's>... well, <laughs> minus the gnats <laughs> in the rain. All okay. right. Well, thank you both so much. Um, to help explain why horseshoe crabs are so vital for certain migratory birds, such as the ones that Don was referencing, biologist Patricia Gonzalez from the Inalafkan Foundation and the International Conservation Fund of Canada joins us now. She's based in Argentina where she studies red knots and shorebird conservation uh, and Patricia is here to tell us a little bit more about the bird that travels from the tip of South America to the Arctic each year. And we'll just wait for the connection and presentation to begin. I think Danielle is just getting our presentation up for us. Here we go. Very complicated times, but I'm really feeling a bit emotion to be with you today at the Jamaica Bay Horseshoe Crab Festival and with my little friend. Please, let's get together in a virtual trip across the continent. Now, we all have wings. Well, what are these birds doing in this beach? This one is a red knot. It's a short bird of a size of a robin. You can see it's on top of a sand full of horseshoe crab eggs to eat. But uh, where do these birds come from? So let me introduce you to Mac. He or she was photographed in Florida only a few days ago. It was a geolocator, which is a device that can record uh, the migratory route of the bird. So I was <laughs> very excited to know that Mac arrived in Florida, you know why? Well, because I saw Mac only 18 days ago in Bahia de San Antonio in Argentina, where I live, where I am now, and this is 6,200 miles away. Indeed, uh, Mac came from further away. Uh, this is in the southern tip of the continent, in Tierra del Fuego. You can see that there, he joined it with thousands of shorebirds that spent the long days of our austral summer. In Tierra del Fuego, the fashion is not to be read. Even Moonbird, you know Moonbird is the most <laughs> famous shorebird in the world. He also is wearing his basic plumage. 
later in March and April in Bahia de San Antonio they become red again, getting their nuptial dress before their long distance migrations. Others will do the same in southern Brazil or in other stopovers. Back to geolocators again. They tell us uh, that the birds can fly 3,000 to 5,000 miles non stop during five or more days and nights, of course. Once they arrive in North America, they are very, very hungry. But shorebirds know that in key places like Jamaica Bay, Delaware Bay, and few others in the US, the eggs of the horseshoe crabs are waiting for them. It is a frenetic time. Look at these bills, full of suns. However, horseshoe crabs have been declining, and this is because fisheries and the biomedical industries. This produced a collapse in the red knot population in the early 2000s, and now red knots, unfortunately, are in danger. Why is that? Red knots can arrive with a body mass of 100 grams and have to increase their body mass to the double. This is like a cup of sugar. And they do this in only 10 to 15 days. An incredible target, which will only be cause eating the super rich horseshoe crab eggs. But they need these body stores not only to fly to the next stop, the next stop which is their Arctic breeding grounds. They also need body reserves to survive the first days in the Arctic at arriving in case uh, that the snow is not melt. And also for survival in case of the occurrence of strong Arctic storms. Once in the Arctic, red knots become a breeding machine. They change the size of their digestive and reproductive organs. It is time to become parents. When the supply of the horseshoe crab eggs is not enough and red knots decide to migrate and breed anyway, their survival and breeding can be at risk. So let's celebrate and protect the horseshoe crabs to keep them alive in synchrony with the amazing long distance migratory shorebirds, but also with all the wildlife that depend on these ancient creatures. We all have beating hearts connected through them. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, Patricia is going to be joining us later live with Caitlin Parkins, and they will both answer questions for you about the horseshoe crabs. We have a lot that have been submitted in the Q&A and the chat, um, and also about red knots and migratory birds and how the two creatures are connected. Um, Next up, we have Rachel Swanson, who is Outreach Conservation Educator at the New York Aquarium. And Rachel has an interactive activity about red knot migration. So get ready to move along with Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name's Rachel from the New York Aquarium. Right now, the aquarium is closed. So I'm coming to you all from my own home where I am nice and safe. At the aquarium, we love horseshoe crabs and want to help protect them. So today we're going to talk about the very special relationship between horseshoe crabs and red knots and what happens when that relationship gets a little out of whack. So if you're at home, I want you to act out alongside me. Here I have my ocean. I have my beach. I also have my horseshoe crab, my red knot, and my horseshoe crab X. And together we're going to walk through a couple different scenarios. So let's get started. For scenario number one, this is what typically happens with the horseshoe crabs and the red knots. First, our red knot begins their long migration from the southern tip of South America, and they begin flying up north to the New York City beaches. So you at home, you can start flapping your wings. Flap, 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 flap. Then in May and June, our horseshoe crabs begin coming out of the ocean water 
to the sandy beaches to lay their eggs in the sand. If you're at home, you can begin crawling like a horseshoe crab. Crawl, 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 crawl. Then in June, our red knots arrive at the New York City beaches. They land in the sand and use their long beaks to eat the horseshoe crab eggs to fuel up for their long migration. You at home can pretend you have a long beak going into the sand and munch on those horseshoe crab eggs. Munch, 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 munch. But don't worry, the horseshoe crabs lay plenty of eggs. So even when the red knots eat some, there's still plenty of eggs that will hatch and grow up to be horseshoe crabs. When the red knots have their fill, they continue on their migration up north to the Arctic. The eggs hatch into horseshoe crabs the horseshoe crabs go back into the ocean. In this scenario, all animals were happy and healthy. The horseshoe crabs were able to lay their eggs and the red knots were able to fuel up for their long migration. But next we're gonna look at a couple different scenarios where climate change plays a role. So the animals get a little bit confused from the rising temperatures or their habitats are impacted. In scenario number two, we're going to look at what happens when the red knots begin their migration a little bit too early because climate change makes the Earth's temperature a little bit warmer. So they think it's time to migrate when it's really not. So this time in January, a little bit earlier than normal, they begin their migration from the southern tip of South America to New York City beaches. Flap, 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 flap they arrive to the New York City beaches before the horseshoe crabs even lay their eggs. So they land on the sandy beaches, but are there any horseshoe crab eggs for them to eat? No. So they are not able to fuel up for their long migration. For scenario number three, we're going to look at what happens when the horseshoe crabs come up onto the sand a little bit too early because climate change has made the Earth's temperature a little bit warmer. So instead of in May and June, the horseshoe crabs start coming up onto the sandy beaches in April before the red knots have even arrived. Crawl, 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 crawl. Our horseshoe crabs lay their eggs in the sand. About two weeks later, they hatch. They enter back into the ocean. Crawl, 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 crawl. And then our red knots, flap, 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 arrive on our New York City beaches. They land in the sand. But are there any horseshoe crab eggs for them to eat? Ugh. Now they still don't have food to fuel on their long migration, and they are not able to continue up to the Arctic. So in these last two scenarios, climate change made the earth temperature and the ocean temperature a little bit warmer. And the animals got a little bit confused and they weren't able to do their migration at the times that they typically do. So the red knots were not able to eat the horseshoe crab eggs. In this last scenario, scenario four, we're gonna look at what happens when climate change makes the sea level start to rise and how that impacts the relationship. So let's begin with our red knots again. They start flying from the southern tip of South America up to New York City beaches. Flap, 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 flap. And this time in May and June, our horseshoe crabs start coming up onto the beaches, but climate change and rising temperatures has made ocean sea levels rise and that washed away some of the beaches. So there is no more sand for the horseshoe crabs to lay their eggs in. So now, when our red knots arrive on the New York City beaches to eat eggs, there's no eggs for them to eat. So again, the red knots cannot fuel up for their long migration. Animals like the horseshoe crab and the red knot rely on each other for food and survival. Climate change and rising temperatures in the earth and the ocean can confuse these animals and impact their habitats so it messes them up a little bit. But there are things that you can do at home to help combat climate change and protect these animals. Try reducing the amount of electricity or energy that you use. And you can also, of course, support the great work that New York City Audubon does to monitor the horseshoe crab population here in New York City. 
Thank you everybody for joining me and learning about the relationship between the horseshoe crab and the red knot. Hope to see you all soon. Bye everybody. Thank you so much, Rachel. We all look forward to the day when we can visit the New York Aquarium again. Um, we are now going to join Caitlin Parkins from New York City Audubon once more. She's going to talk to us a little bit about how, as we've just learned, life is a bit fraught for migratory birds and horseshoe crabs. Caitlin's going to explain to us a little bit more about the conservation issues facing horseshoe crabs today. All right. Thank you so much, Karen, uh, for um, that. Can you guys see my screen here? We can. Great. Um, so the one thing I want everyone to do, and I think almost everybody has found that chat box already, but there is going to be a live quiz. There is a test. Uh, and so I, uh, I want you guys to find that chat box so you can participate with me uh, a little bit uh, through this presentation. Um, so we've gotten a really good introduction to horseshoe crabs uh, from everyone we've seen so far. And what I want to focus on is horseshoe crab conservation. So why these animals are vulnerable, um, what New York City Audubon and our partners are doing to help them, and then also what you can do to help horseshoe crabs as well. So let's get started here. I've got my chat box up. All right, right into it. Why are horseshoe crabs in trouble? So Aurora mentioned over harvesting, and there were a lot of questions about what does that actually mean? So horseshoe crabs are currently classified as vulnerable by the IUCN because of over harvesting in the 80s and 90s. This meant that the horseshoe crabs were overfished in the 80s and 90s for two reasons, which I'll get into in just a second. Recently, there have been restrictions put on harvesting, um, and that has stabilized some populations, like the Delaware Bay population, but we're not really seeing these populations coming back to where, you know, that they were before. Um, and then with climate change, we expect that we'll see even more declines. And New York State and New, uh, New England populations actually are continuing to decline, so they haven't stabilized at all. All right, so why are they harvested? Biomedical use is the, one of the big reasons. About 500,000 crabs every year are removed from waters for biomedical use. And what you're seeing there is that blue blood that Don was talking about. So uh, horseshoe crabs have blue blood because it has copper in it. Ours is red because we have iron in it instead. Those uh, liter bottles of blue blood are actually worth about $15,000 each because horseshoe crab blood is critical to uh, um, uh, medical uh, science, actually. So there's an extract from horseshoe crab blood called Limulus amoebocyte lysate. It is a compound in horseshoe crab blood that when it comes into contact with bacterial endotoxins, bacterial endotoxins are actually a component of the cell membrane of certain types of bacteria. They're actually all over the environment. They're everywhere, but they become a problem when they get into human blood and inside our bodies. They can cause infection. And so if you put limulus amoebocyte lysate with a bacterial endotoxin, it actually clumps up and coagulates. And so we can use LAL to test pharmaceuticals and medical devices and see whether or not they are clear and clean of bacterial endotoxins and okay to be put into um, a human body. So super, super important for people. Um, unfortunately, horseshoe crabs pay the price for that. Um, they are released back into the water without, uh, you know, they don't kill the horseshoe crabs. They take about 30% of the blood. Um, and mortality is somewhere between 3 and 30%, and that's self-reported by the biomedical companies. But what we're concerned about is that non-lethal effects could happen. So imagine you're a horseshoe crab, you're out of the water for a really long time, you're maybe transported in a really hot truck, you're maybe put back into the water somewhere that you weren't captured from. So horseshoe crabs can be really disoriented and scientists are actually finding that horseshoe crabs are, um, you know, not really able to spawn or do what they uh, do, basically live a normal horseshoe crab life after bleeding, which is not good. So I see um, some really good questions here already. Um, and somebody said, find another test. Well, actually, for about 20 years, another test has been available. A synthetic alternative called RFC, which is recombinant factor C, is available. And it was created in Singapore, like I said, two decades ago. Um, but 
it took or it's taking a really long time for biomedical companies to adopt this synthetic alternative. Um, they don't really have the uh, incentive to do so because horseshoe crab blood works really well. Um, and so uh, it took a really long time, a lot of research. Finally, in 2012, the FDA said that uh, uh, RFC could be used in place of LAL, but only if it was proven to work as well or better. And that research takes lots of time and lots of money. And so um, only now are pharmaceutical companies feeling pressure from people um, who want them to start using RFC instead of LAL and are finally kind of starting to adopt this very, very slowly. Um, I see, can this procedure be banned? Um, really, I mean, we don't want it to be banned, uh, at least not until RFC has been completely proven safe and effective for all pharmaceuticals and drugs because humans rely on it. So it's really important. Um, how can we help? I'm going to have an entire section on how we can help at the end. So hold on to that. The other reason horseshoe crabs were harvested um, is bait fisheries. So millions of horseshoe crabs were removed in the 80s and 90s with no regulation at all, um, which is part of the reason for population declines and that low population that we're seeing now. There are quotas put in place um, and most fishermen follow those quotas. They only take a certain number of horseshoe crabs um, out of the water. And um, there, I mean, it's working very well, but there is still some poaching in places where uh, harvesting is not allowed, like Jamaica Bay. Um, so if you can imagine, when the horseshoe crabs all come up to spawn on the same beach, it's a really easy place for fishermen to get the uh, horseshoe crabs. And so um, sometimes they are poached from their spawning grounds. Okay. And there is a synthetic alternative to the artificial bait as well. Um, University of Delaware and DuPont collaborated and they came up with this artificial bait that uses only 1 16th of a horseshoe crab as opposed to one half of a horseshoe crab. And it does work just as well. But as you can imagine, fishermen are slow to adopt it. They wanna know that it works and it also needs to not be prohibitively expensive, which is really important. Um, and so uh, we're also hoping that as more research is conducted, proving the effectiveness of artificial bait, that it will definitely um, be adopted in the future. All right, and as Patricia um, already went over, horseshoe crabs are really important because their eggs are a really critical food source for migratory shorebirds. And the red knot is the one seen here. Um, I did get a question here. I see, do people eat horseshoe crab? In Asia, horseshoe crabs are definitely considered um, a delicacy food item. So they are eaten in other places. Generally, I don't think um, many people in the US. And for them to be bait, um, they are bait for eel and conch, and uh, by far female horseshoe crabs are the best bait for those species. So um, when we get into shorebirds, you can imagine um, horseshoe crab eggs are really fatty, they're really energy rich. These shorebirds need to stop over, put on weight fast, get the energy they need to keep on migrating up to the Canadian Arctic to breed. And the Delaware Bay is really a critical place um, for them to do that, but also the Long Island Sound, Jamaica Bay, and also Long Island are really great for red knots and some other shorebirds. So here is your first quiz. <laughs> um, all of the birds pictured here are birds that migrate through New York City and stop over. And I want to know if anyone knows what any of these birds are. So go ahead and type into the chat box your guesses as to what these birds are. Maybe we can find out who in our audience are the bird people. Red knot. Yes, so we've definitely got the red knot in there. That's the bottom uh, right hand picture. There's another bird in there that has red or a word for red in its name. Yep. Ruddy turnstone. Uh, sandpiper. There is a sandpiper, or actually several kinds of sandpipers. There's no plovers here. The top right picture, you can tell what bird that is. It's notable because it has a drooping bill, um, if you know what that one is. Yep. The one at the very bottom uh, left, if you've seen uh, the Pixar short film Piper, um, that is, yes, a Sanderling. Um, so that's what that film, uh, that cartoon was based off of. So. Let me just show you here. So we've got our ruddy turnstones, our dunlins, our sanderlings, semi-palmated sandpipers. This is a species that New York City Audubon Science Team focuses on a lot. We have a banding program as well as a nanotagging program for this species. And then, of course, the important red knot in the bottom right corner. All right, so what are we doing to protect horseshoe crabs? 
Well, New York City Audubon, I think there's probably quite a few people on this uh, webinar who have done this with us. Um, if you've ever gone out and surveyed horseshoe crabs in New York State, you've been part of the New York Horseshoe Crab Monitoring Network. This is a program run by the Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, and we at New York City Audubon are part of it, along with tons of other volunteers, uh, government agencies, and other nonprofit groups. About 600 volunteers work on this program every single year across 30 sites where horseshoe crabs are uh, monitored. Yes, sadly, there is no monitoring this year, so we're going to have the virtual monitoring experience here in just a few minutes. Um, what does that mean to monitor horseshoe crabs? For those of you who haven't gone out with us, and I do hope in future years you will be able to join us for monitoring, um, what we do is go out and we count the horseshoe crabs around the new and full moons in May and June when they're spawning. We go out on 12 nights. We also tag the crabs. So um, across the entire network, about 5,000 uh, tags are put out every single year across all 30 sites. Um, in New York City, um, the site four sites that New York City Audubon coordinates, we put out about 800 tags a year, about 200 per beach. Um, so a really big tagging effort there. How come it's usually at night is a question. Well, horseshoe crabs monitor, uh, come up and spawn during the highest high tides during the new and full moons. And the highest high tides happen at night. So on the new and full moons, high tides might not be until 9 or 10 p.m. And so that is what um, when we go out. So uh, if you look, actually, let's go back real quick. Let me see if I can go back one. Um, if you look really quick at the picture all the way to the left side of your screen, um, the person in that photo um, who actually, that's me, um, <laughs> has, uh, is holding a quadrat survey. So at some sites, there aren't that many horseshoe crabs and we can go out and count all of them. At the New York City sites, three of them, there are actually um, so many horseshoe crabs that there's no way that we could go out and count them all. So what we do is take a sample of the crabs and we use quadrats, these squares, white plastic squares, to go out and put them down and count just the crabs in the sample. And then we can extrapolate those numbers to the entire Entire beach. And so if you can imagine, this is how it looks. We put the quadrat down um, and we count all of the crabs whose bodies are more than halfway inside of the um, of the quadrat. So in this example, particularly, we also want to look at males and females. And so Aurora and Don both told you about the differences between males and females. Females are really big, males are much smaller, and they're usually clustered around her. So in this particular um, photo, uh, we've got four males surrounding one female. So the red arrow is the female, and the blue arrows are the males, and so we would record this as one female, four males in our quadrat. So we're going to do this experience. I want you guys to get in that chat box and take a guess. If you were to put your quadrat down on these horseshoe crabs, how many males and how many females are in this quadrat? And I'll give you a second. Three and one. Three and one. All right, we've got a ton of answers. And it looks like every single one is correct. So easy, this is super simple, right? We've got here uh, three, three males and one female. All right, so we're gonna go and we're gonna try another one. All right, how many males and how many females in this quadrat? Maybe this one is gonna take a little bit longer. Two and seven? Nine and one, 10 and one, two or three females, question marks. <laughs> All right, so uh, maybe it's not quite as easy in this photo. And this one's a little bit harder because we are looking at it from an angle that we wouldn't. Um... In this photo, there are nine males and three females. And for those of you who don't believe me, I put little stars on all the males uh, and the red stars on the females. So that female in the back who's almost completely buried uh, is a little bit hard to count. And remember, we only count crabs that have more than half of their body in the quadrat. It says much easier when they're not moving. Um, yeah, when you put that quadrat down, you kind of have to take like a 
really quick snapshot in your mind of what this looks like because it's um, quite hard when they start moving um, to count them all. And we also, just as a note, we don't dig up buried crabs and we don't move the crabs and we don't do anything that would disturb their spawning activity um, because we, you know, missing one male is uh, okay. Um, we just don't want to do anything that would disturb the spawning. All right, and my last one here, how many males and how many females in this photo? One and one. I'm gonna give one and one, one and two, one male, one female, one rock. All right, I might have put this one in as a trick question. This is actually two males and one rock. So if you're ever out during horseshoe crab spawning and the males are cruising around, you might notice that the males will come up and try to mate with your boot or your foot or anything else in the water. Um, they come up, they try to sense it and see if it's a female that they can clasp onto. So this is just two males and one rock. All right, tagging. So one of the questions we got earlier um, is, does tagging hurt, um, hurt horseshoe crabs? And Don answered that question, but I just want to reiterate, no. Scientists have done a lot of research to make sure that the horseshoe crabs are definitely not, um, you know, uh, they aren't uh, negatively affected by the tagging process. So we don't disturb them. Um, we don't like dig up spawning females to tag. We only really tag the ones that are out and cruising and not actively laying eggs and spawning at the time of our tagging process. Um, and we definitely would never want to do anything to hurt the crabs. So this is what tagging looks like. We actually use a drill or just a little hole, puncture a hole in the carapace and pop that button tag right in. And the tagging data gives us some really important information. So we got some questions earlier about horseshoe crab migration. Um, you know, we know a lot about what happens when they come up on the beach for those two months that they're spawning, but no one really knows what they're doing the rest of the year. From trawl surveys, we know they can be as far as 30 miles off uh, of the shoreline, but, um, you know, what are they doing in that interim time? So one of the things we learn is sort of how they move. And so for this example, in 2011, in May, um, there was a horseshoe crab spawning on the beach that was tagged. We reported that tag and found out that it was originally tagged on the south shore of Long Island in 2007. Um, and the really interesting part was that in between that time, it had actually spawned on the North Shore of Long Island in 2010. So they're really, um, you know, moving around a lot more than maybe we realize, and they don't come back to the same beach to spawn every year. There's definitely movement between beaches between years. Um, there is a specific spot. The tag is always placed on the back uh, left uh, carapace. And so, um, just really, really cool stuff we've learned, and it's how far can they go is one of the questions. I have to say, this is all pretty new research. We just don't know that much about horseshoe crabs. Um, some really cool things is that technology is getting cheaper and smaller, and that means that recently we've been able to start putting satellite tags on horseshoe crabs. Um, it's still too expensive to put them out on tons of crabs, so maybe uh, I know there's a researcher at Stony Brook who puts satellite tags on 30 crabs, um, but, uh, you know, this is sort of synergistic science where we can put out 5,000 tags a year all over New York and then we can also have the satellite tags and we can piece together all of this data to get a better picture of what the horseshoe crabs are doing, which is really cool. How far was the farthest horseshoe crab? I know that we have found tagged crabs in Connecticut, um, but I don't know, uh, you know, the uh, scientists have tagged probably hundreds of thousands of crabs at this point all along the East Coast. And I don't have that full data set, so I don't know um, the answer. How do we choose which ones? Um, we have a set number of tags to put out for each beach that is regulated by Fish and Wildlife, National Park Service, and other government agencies. And we just go out, we choose crabs that we're not disturbing, and we just put as many tags out in a night as we can because we might come back the next night and there won't be any horseshoe crabs. So um, they're pretty dependent. I mean, I mean, they're definitely, um, you know, uh, subject to the temperature and the water. So it could be the full moon and a high tide, but if the water is really rough and if the temperature is below 59 degrees, they often will not be um, spawning.
All right, what are the data used for? So a lot of you have probably participated in this. This is a volunteer effort, but the data are real. This is real science that, that um, you know, everyone is doing. And so the data are used for species status assessments, management decisions, and advocacy work. Um, and so what can you do to help protect horseshoe crabs. Well, one thing you can do is that next year you can come out and survey crabs with us. We really uh, hope and expect that our program um, will be running and we do hope that you will join us for that. But some other things you can do, report tags. So I went out to Big Egg Marsh two nights ago and this is a picture of a horseshoe crab I found. I reported the tag right away to the Fish and Wildlife Service in hopes that maybe they would get back to me um, by now, but they haven't, which is expected. Um, so so you can go right to uh, Fish and Wildlife Service website, it's fws.gov slash crab tag, take a picture of that number, enter it in along with some other information, um, and uh, definitely report it. Um, super important information, you get a really cool certificate saying where the crab was tagged and the researchers get uh, your sighting as well. And then the other thing that we were asked earlier is, do you uh, pick up horseshoe crabs? And so uh, I made a little video to show you exactly how to do it. All right, so I'm seeing that there's no sound on the video. Thank you for letting me know. I'm um, not sure exactly what's going on, but I can narrate over it. Horseshoe crabs don't flip themselves over on purpose. That was a question we got earlier. They get flipped over because of the tides and the waves and it's an accident. They're vulnerable then to drying out and vulnerable to being eaten by birds and other things like that. And so if you go over to the horseshoe crab, um, you definitely, um, Oh, that's why there's no sound. It's muted. Well, regardless, um, you definitely don't want to pick it up um, by the telson or the tail. Um, you, what you want to do is grab it by the front of the shell like that and just hold it with both hands, gently flip it over, walk it down to the edge of the water, and then put it back into the water and it'll be on its way. Yeah, I'm seeing, I do have the volume off on the video. I have it just totally muted. So sorry about that, everyone. But now you know exactly how to pick up a horseshoe crab um, and flip it back over if you find one on the beach. So just another way you can help horseshoe crabs if you happen to find one. Finally, you can share the shore. Um, so a lot of the birds that are migrating through and nesting, really what they need is just to be left alone. They need to be uh, have time to eat, have time to rest so that they can continue on migration so that they can feed their chicks if they're nesting. Um, and so uh, what you can do is just give them space, um, keep your dog on a leash so that it can't disturb them, don't go into fenced off nesting areas, um, and this will help both the, the horseshoe crabs and the birds. Um, one of the questions we got earlier is also um, how, uh, what, you know, is it better to completely stay off the beach while the horseshoe crabs are spawning? The horseshoe crabs really aren't paying attention to you, and is, so if you're walking around while they're spawning, you're not going to disturb them. What you don't want to do is pick up crabs that are spawning, dig them out of the water, step on them, but going out on the beach and observing the spawning is a really incredible thing that I hope all of you will go out when you can do it safely um, and, and observe. It's not going to hurt the crabs, and, and I think it's a really incredible thing um, that, that would be really lovely for all of you to see. And finally, you can be an advocate. Um, the, you can participate in public comment periods. For example, if the New York State DEC decides to change the quota to raise it or lower it for harvesting, they will have a public comment period that you can participate in before they make that decision where you can support or, you know, say that you don't support that. You can also contact your representatives um, about legislation. So there actually was horseshoe crab moratorium legislation introduced just earlier this week into the New York Senate. Um, State Senate, and so we are following that legislation, but you will have an opportunity to contact your representatives about whether you support that legislation or if you don't. And then also, 
If you want to keep up to date on these opportunities um, and you don't want to miss those opportunities, you can sign up to be an advocate um, with the New York City uh, Audubon Avian Advocates email. If you go to our website, nycaudubon.org, um, you'll get emails from our advocacy and outreach manager, Molly Adams, who is here actually answering a lot of your questions right now. So thank you, Molly. Um, and she sends out emails about once a month with opportunities that you can be an advocate for birds and horseshoe crabs. Um, and so with that, I know I'm only looking at the chat box I wasn't able to get to all of your questions, and I'm sorry, um, but there is a Q&A at the end um, of the Horseshoe Crab Festival where hopefully we can answer some more of your questions. Please leave them in the Q&A box. I'm really excited to talk with you all more uh, in a little while. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Caitlin, uh, especially for all the pragmatic and positive ways that we can all help both the horseshoe crabs and migratory shorebirds. Next up, uh, we have Heather Feather and Valentina Gallup, and they are the co-creators of the children's book, Horseshoe Crab's Crown, and they'd like us to go on a journey with them through time. So let's travel with Horseshoe Crab and her friends as they work together to uncover the moon and ultimately make the world a better place. Horseshoe Crab's Crown. Written by Heather Feather, illustrated by Valentina Gallup. Dedicated to Akupara, Ao, and World Turtle for carrying the earth on their backs. In all of its days and all of its ways, the earth has seen many, many creatures. Some so much the same, you can retrace where their pathways once parted. Others so strange and striking, they leave you in lasting awe. Life can occur easily here on Earth, in the ebb and flow of our seas, allowing creatures large and small to make their case for survival. But sometimes, ice or heat or cosmic collisions will reset these natural rhythms. 65 million years ago, eyes deep in the sand, horseshoe crabs slept, missing the asteroid that entered the Earth's atmosphere, forever changing the life that lived there. It stirred up so much sand and soil that no sky or sun could be seen. And Horseshoe Crab, awaking to unusual darkness, searched the skies with her 14 eyes, looking for the warm welcome of her moon. Ten legs took her to shore where large beasts had once wandered. Now only darkness reigned about her, and no matter how hard she swung her powerful telson, she could not move the clouds from the air. Back into the sea she wondered, what to do, what to do? How could Horseshoe Crab bring back her moon? With not much more to offer beyond the strength of her shell, off she went to find some help. Not long looking, she observed another creature who rolled with the underwater waves. Hey you, what to do? How do we uncover the moon? Opening only slightly, Muscle whispered, I can, I can help, I can. I may not walk, I may not, walk, I may not, not swim, swim, but I, I can clean the darkness from, from the water, piece by piece. piece. And using his byssus, a cluster of fine threads, Muscle affixed himself to the hard head of Horseshoe Crab. Their collective journey was only a few steps in when they heard a chorus of voices. Hello, hello, us too, said Barnacles clustered only a few feet away. We can also filter the silt from the sea. They waved their feathery siri until Horseshoe Crab crawled to them, and binding their bodies head first to the surface of her shell, they began doing their part, piece by piece, to uncover the moon. Patterns in the sand revealed woven pathways of creatures sliding along, leaving clean sand in their wake. However not at these trails, Horseshoe Crab found her way through them and discovered mud snail eating debris. 
Mud Snail looked up without shame. One fish's trash is a mud snail's treasure. Would you? Could you help? We must uncover the moon, cried Horseshoe Crab. And without hesitation, Mud Snail joined the journey, each animal doing what they do best to uncover the moon, piece by piece, bit by bit. As the water became clearer, they saw a boisterous beast dragging his home behind him. Hermit Crab knocked on every shell and surface and slurped every substance off of every grain of sand. He exclaimed the Earth's new beginning. You seek the moon, I see, he said with slender eyes. Muscle and barnacles will clear the water and I will help Mud Snail clean the sand, but who will clean the air? Not entirely knowing, but feeling certain nonetheless, Horseshoe Crab assured Hermit Crab, the more we look, the more we'll find, piece by piece, bit by bit, little by little. And the marine friends moved ahead in the murk with only their hope to guide them. The journey lasted mere minutes, or maybe even millions of years, for without the sun it was hard to tell the movement of days. But the creatures kept on until light began to creep through the clouds, revealing an oasis of green, waving and welcoming in the shallows. We work together to uncover our moon, exclaimed Horseshoe Crab, excited for the promise of the planet. Eelgrass whispered its delight. We want this world to thrive. And with each green grass breath, the air became cleaner as oxygen entered the atmosphere. And through the sway of the eelgrass blades, peaked a guiding friend from the past. Piece by piece, bit by bit, little by little, breath by breath, they had uncovered the moon. Gradually, the world became welcoming again to lingering life and all of its persistent creatures. The animals continued their journey for many more millions of years, watching and waiting for the moon to forever be a part of the patterns and cycles of our planet. The End That was truly just beautiful. Absolutely wonderful story um, and the animations. I, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Next up, we have a, um, an art project with New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium's Build a Horseshoe Crab Activity. And that is presented for us by Aiden Halpin of Gateways National Recreation Area. <laughs> Here are all the supplies you'll need to make your own horseshoe crab. Two pieces of paper, a pair of scissors and some tape, brass fasteners and paper clips can also be used optionally to make the horseshoe crab's tail spin all the way around. Lastly, you'll need your favorite type of coloring utensil. And that's it, we're ready to start building our very own horseshoe crabs. The first step is to print out our horseshoe crab outlines on our two pieces of paper. Step two, we're gonna color our horseshoe crabs. Step three, cut out all three parts of your horseshoe crab, the prosoma, the abdomen, and the telson. Step four, use your tape to attach the prosoma to the abdomen this will give your horseshoe crab more flexibility and allow it to behave a bit more like the real thing. Step five, attach the telson to the abdomen. This is where you can be using those brass fasteners or paper clips, but if you only have tape lying around, that works just as well. Just don't expect it to be rotating in a 360 degree way.
the last step, if you'd like for your model to be a little bit more 3D or have a little bit more texture, simply fold each side inwards. And voila, you've got yourself a horseshoe crab. All right, I think we all now have a rainy day activity to do and uh, the presentations are over today. We've learned a lot about horseshoe crabs today, but I know that we all have a lot of questions. Um, so to help us answer some questions about horseshoe crabs and migratory shorebirds, we have New York City Audubon's Caitlin Parkins, who's joined us again to answer some of your questions live, along with biologist Patricia Gonzalez, who joins us live from Argentina. So uh, you can leave questions that you may have in the uh, chat or the um, Q&A feature. I'm going to start with some of them now because we have a lot of really good questions. Um, one of the first ones um, comes from Sarah and uh, Patricia, maybe this is best directed to you. Do you know if there is any research on red knots eating plastic instead of horseshoe crab eggs? No, I really don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, and we have a question from Anonymous. Uh, that question is, at what water depth uh, where, are hor where are horseshoe crabs when not reproducing at the shore? So when we don't see them, where, at what depth, Caitlin, generally do they live? That's a really good question. Um, I don't exactly know the water depth. I do know that they can be found as far as 30 miles offshore when not spawning. So pretty deep. <laughs> Okay. Um, Patricia, when did scientists first notice the interdependence of horseshoe crabs and red knots and the relationship between the two species? Well, it has been known about the dependence before the years 2000. However, the first scientific uh, demonstration uh, came from a paper from the Alan Baker from Royal Ontario Museum and all the team in Delaware Bay and South American people, including me, in, in 2004, uh, when the survival of red knots and the decline stars and what demonstrated the interlink with the uh, horseshoe crab eggs. Okay, great. Um, and Caitlin, um, can you go over just once um, how to tell a horseshoe crab's age? Uh, if um, one, one viewer is saying, that we know that horseshoe crabs don't acquire a barnacle layer until they're about the age of 10, so how do you determine their actual age? And another question somebody asked was when they molt, how does that affect the tagging? Yeah. Both really good questions. Um, so first, remember that horseshoe crabs have a terminal molt at the time that they reach adulthood, about 10 years, and they don't molt anymore after that. And so uh, we only tag adults who are spawning. And so uh, that tag goes on a crab that will no longer molt. And that's how we just make sure that the tags won't interfere with molting. Uh, the second question, it's really hard to age horseshoe crabs. So some of the ages are known from the tagging data. Um, so scientists actually have a scale that they use um, and basically you look at the shell and the condition of the shell and you rate the shell based on that scale. So uh, a young horseshoe crab would have a really clean, uh, you know, not cracked, not chipped uh, shell and then maybe uh, the next one in the scale would have some barnacles and epibionts on it and then uh, the horseshoe crab shell tends to darken, uh, have some rot in it and also just be totally covered with epibionts. Um, and so you can't really look at a crab and say this one is 20 years old but you can rate it on this scale. Okay great. Um, Patricia Dahlia asks what is the red knot's lifespan? Oh, okay, during the declining after the year 2000, it was thought about seven years, which is not very much. Um, however, there were very uh, well-known survivors like B95, a moonbird, a bird that lived at least 22 years old. And it was thought that during that time flew 
for a distance uh, like uh, the one that goes from the earth to the moon and coming back. And this year I saw a bird here in Bahia de San Antonio that had been banded in 98. These are real survivors, so uh, not all the birds do the same. And Patricia, are you gathering your data um, about the birds' migrations through geolocators, or are you equally reliant on tags on their legs and citizen scientists saying, oh, I see this bird in Jamaica Bay, I see this bird in Delaware Bay? Oh, yes. Uh, we use everything. Uh, now we are, you know, satellites, uh, transmitters are becoming smaller and smaller, so now we are a, a bit going for in that direction. But still we didn't put anyone here. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to check our chat and see if there are some other questions here that we might um, answer. Caitlin, has anyone ever tested the IQ of horseshoe crabs? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I do know, I know that, you know, some of our uh, mollusks are, uh, you know, squid and octopus. Octopi are, uh, you know, really intelligent creatures. I don't think horseshoe crabs have that kind of intelligence. Um, I, you know, they're kind of moving around, reacting directly to what they're sensing. Um, but I mean, they're pretty cool creatures, and I, I just don't know that anyone has ever tested it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and where do they sleep since they eat at night? That is a good question. They definitely rest during the day, um, a little bit offshore. During the spawning season, they don't really go too far from those beaches where they're spawning, but they generally don't uh, rest during the day on the beaches unless they're really dug into the sand where they can stay nice and moist and not dry out. Okay. And Patricia, we heard a little bit about this in our presentations today about what happens um, if with climate, the effect of climate, uh, change or really a crisis is what it is, um, what the effect is on both the horseshoe crabs and the red knots. But what are you learning from your research about the populations of red knots um, in the face of um, climate crisis? Well, that's a really important question. We all are having the same questions. What we are seeing here is that uh, the phenology, that means the time when red knots are appear, arriving here is every year later. And we know that uh, migrating later may have a fitness consequence. However, they are departing about the same time. And apparently this is uh, something to do with the availability of the prey, which in turns are affected by the temperature as well. The temperature also affects the behavior of us, of the people going to the beaches, so there are more disturbances for birds. In the Arctic, uh, during the breeding season, there is a moment of the peak of insects. This a crucial moment is important for the survival of the chicks. And what is happening uh, is that there is a, mis is a mismatch, what is called a mismatch between the peak of this insect production and the chicks, which also can affect the, the survival and production, production of youngs of uh, red knots or in shorebirds as well. So they have to deal with this kind of mismatch. And uh, there is a very nice study from Tony Spearsman's teams uh, with another subspecies in Africa where it has, uh, they show that the temperature affected the size of the juveniles in the Arctic. The juveniles became smaller with shorter bills, and when they arrive in the bank there again in Africa, yes. they cannot reach the, the more profitable, profitable place, sorry, um, and this affects uh, their survival. Well, just as an example, <laughs> or I will talk more. That's it. That's a challenge. And Caitlin, this, uh, for the horseshoe crabs, are you noting a difference during, um, in the timing when the horseshoe crabs are coming to spawn? Or is that so regulated by the tides that it isn't really, there isn't really a seasonal shift that can be attributed to, to any climate change? Um, so the data that I've seen uh, for New York specifically, and really we haven't been monitoring horseshoe crabs in New York State that long, about a decade, and so it just might not be long enough to see that shift. Um, but generally the peak horseshoe crab spawning is in late May or early 
uh, early June, so the new and the full moons at the end of May, beginning of June. And it sort of switches from year to year. And also, like you said, is highly dependent on the temperature as well of the water itself, uh, which can change from year to year. So I think we're going to need a much longer data set in order to see like a, a real shift. We just don't have enough information yet. Okay. I know we have more questions coming in. So um, we're going to move on to our um, final segment to complete our Zoom today. Um, but if, if Caitlin and Patricia wouldn't mind, perhaps you, you would both answer some questions in the chat directly to viewers who are her typing them. That would be so great. Absolutely. Working on it now. <laughs> all right. Thank you both so much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us for the fourth annual Horseshoe Crab Festival. We hope you, you've learned a lot. And just to make sure that you did, we have a little game for you to play. So if you get your cell phone and go into your browser and type in kahoot.it, that's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T, uh, and you can input the code that you'll see on your screen, uh, register and play our live online quiz game. Uh, it's going to be really fun. If everybody... Uh, a moment to register. The code is 505540. And if you don't want to play online with us, then you can put your answers up. job everyone almost everyone got it right that's awesome <laughs> all right and first uh, the pin was 505540 I don't know if you can still join but give it a try and we'll move on to our next question Two, if you got it right, a scorpion, as we learned from Aurora's presentation earlier today. All right, next question. Good job, oh, Sammy in the lead. Oh, oh and anyway. oh, Nicolette. Nicolette, nice. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Excellent. I think everybody got that right. Blue-blooded. <laughs> they are the true blue-blooded creature. <laughs> All right, next question. All of 
the above, harvesting for bait, biomedical use, and climate change, all problems for horseshoe crab populations. All right, and next question. Scoreboard's looking good, good job. Ooh, Nicolette, <laughs> nice. All right, last question. That's a tough question. Uh, that, as we learned from Patricia's presentation, Mac uh, is a red knot who wears a geolocator. And while he started out in Argentina, or she, we're not sure, um, Mac was last seen in Florida just uh, two days ago. And uh, is either there or winging his or her way to our area or Delaware Bay en route to the Arctic. All right, let's see the scoreboard and see how everyone did on our quiz today. Yeah, good job. Well done, everyone, and thank you for playing. Hope you enjoyed that. All right, and uh, that is the end of our Horseshoe Crab Festival. A brand new experiment for us here at New York City Audubon, but we really enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you all to our partners who helped make this festival possible and who readily embraced a whole new way to share the wonder of the horseshoe crab. Thank you to the National Park Service, to the American Literal Society, to Jamaica Bay Rockways Parks Conservancy, and the New York Aquarium. Thank you to Patricia Gonzalez, to Aurora and Kate Perkins, and to all the contributors who helped make today so special. Uh, please visit newyorkaudubon.org to find out more about future events like this one and we hope that everyone has a wonderful Memorial Day and a very special thank you to our Daniel Sherman, uh, the volunteer behind the stage who helped everything work out just today. Thank you so much. We hope to see you next year at Jamaica Bay. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>